the Cassar Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, and is always available for your listening pleasure at HallieCasserJane.com. Thank you so much for joining me. I am Hallie Kesser Jane. Today on the Hallie Kesser Jane Show, we're taking a look at the new sorority, Diane Sawyer, Katie Couric, and Christiane Amanpour. The title and the subjects of the provocative new book by seasoned journalist Sheila Weller, who will be joining me at my table. Hold on to your hats, folks. You are in for one heck of a conversation. But before we begin, a brief message from our sponsors. You are listening to The Hallie Kesser Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds. The Hallie Kesser Jane Show is always available online at HallieCasserJane.com, on BlogTalkRadio.com, and be sure to visit us at our newest home on iHeartRadio. Today, the Hallie Kesser Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With over 150,000 titles in virtually every genre, you'll find what you're looking for. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today by signing up at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Hallie Kasser Jane Show. Is someone you love living with frequent pain? Are they spending more time just sitting in a chair or lying in bed or going to the ER more often? Other than taking them to the doctor, you may not know what else to do. Treasure Coast Hospice can help in more ways than you may realize. Even if you don't think your loved one is ready for hospice care, their experts can evaluate your loved one's condition and direct you to the right resources in our community. Call Treasure Coast Hospice to learn more or visit pchospice.org. Journalist Sheila Weller forged her career with her scintillating true life tales drawn directly from the news. She is the author of seven books, three of which are New York Times bestsellers, including Girls Like Us, Carol King, Joni Mitchell, Carly Simon, and The Journey of a Generation. Weller has covered domestic abuse, upscale marriages, wife killing, and secret rapes in storybook communities, as well as her own family's halcyon life and the tragic demise of the premier Hollywood nightclub they owned in her acclaimed memoir, Dancing at Ciro's. A contributing editor at Glamour, a writer for Vanity Fair and the New York Times Book Review, among others, Weller is respected among her peers for her comprehensive, evocative, investigative writing about all aspects of women's lives and issues. Given her background, it is no surprise that her newest contribution to culture is the most talked about book of the season, the new sorority, Diane Sawyer, Katie Couric, Christiane Amanpour, and the ongoing, imperfect, complicated triumph of women in TV news. All right, my friend. So you know I can think of no one better suited to write this amazing book of yours, Sheila. It, it was as if everything that came before led you into this. So Thank bef- you. It's true. So before we get into the heart of the news sorority, I want to talk about Sheila Weller, the girl who grew up in the shadow of the Hollywood Hills, the daughter of a right, 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 right. true, true, the daughter yeah, of a brilliant yeah. brain surgeon father with a movie magazine right. writer for a mother whose right. brother owned what he owns here is the brother owns heroes. Yes. That yes. brilliant, great place. Everybody used to hang out in, in, uh, in LA, in, in Hollywood. Right. Uh, the subject of your acclaimed memoir, dancing at heroes. Talk to me about that childhood though. Seriously, growing up in that atmosphere, what did that bring to Sheila Weller? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, my mother was kind of my role model. She was always typing away. She was as childhood friends who I've reconnected with on Facebook. Remind me, she was the only, only career woman in that whole crowd, <laughs> that whole crowd of PTA mothers. So that was one thing. You know, I make the point in, in my memoir that we were, I, I kind of wanted to write a, a memoir about the LA Jews. There were all, all these books about the New York Jews. And so I wanted to write about the people that were in my parents' crowd, the people that came to LA to kind of reinvent themselves between the wars. And it was just a kind of a distinct 
culture, very different from New York. And when they got into situations like owning nightclubs or becoming big producers and directors, they were kind of in over their heads, so to speak. And whatever dramatic and catastrophic things happened to the kind of the movie stars and the, and the sort of wild people that they made their living with, when they picked it up, it became even more catastrophic. So that's kind of the book in a nutshell. That's the book. Your uncle tried to kill your dad? Is that Yes, right? he did. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. Kiddo, but how did that all affect you? I mean, well, your insight. I mean, let me let me let me let me give you a compliment. Your insight into women is extraordinary. That had to have oh, come from you. some of this. Thank you. You know, it's funny. I mean, the truth is, when you are a tween and a teenager, this stuff affects you. But it, what really affects you the most is the way the cool kids in high school think of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know so, that one. <laughs> um, I, so I, I don't know. I mean, you know, at, later you kind of make sense of it, and later you sort of figure figure things out about. It, but it obviously affects you a lot. I'm, I mean, my mother had a major br- nervous breakdown and she was attempting suicide and leaving suicide notes. So that definitely affects you a lot, you know, and my sister and I had to kind of be our, be the caretakers in the family for a while. So that probably made us mature, even though for a long time we didn't particularly evince that side of our personalities <laughs> in the 60s, you know, but I, I wouldn't have trade, I wouldn't trade my childhood, you know, for, for anybody else's. I mean, I think it's, you know, it, 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 uh, it steals you. It, 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 it gives you, I guess, some insight that you don't really quite know where it came from, but, um, you sort of are later forced to analyze things that were so hard to process that maybe you get better at analyzing other things. So maybe that's how it affected me. I, I think it did. And your cousin, uh, Ellen Jane Hover, also, uh, that was a yeah. tragedy. That was, uh, she was like your third sister. Oh, what as, you? Yes, like my third sister. As, 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 as young children, yes, she was murdered by a, uh, a horrible serial killer that most people have not heard of. And, as you know, Hallie, because you and I have had our little things about politics <laughs> all over the place. And I'm, I'm like a liberal who believes in capital punishment. <laughs> right. I love it. <laughs> and I, and I, <laughs> I've had these little Facebook arguments about it. I don't even bother anymore because, you know, that, but, that's yeah. an issue you can't go near sort of thing. But I'll say this to you. You've experienced what most of us haven't. That gives yeah. what you have to say, you know, a, a, a whole lot more wisdom right. than yeah. me coming from the journalism point of view and putting out my uh, two yeah. cents about it. So I always respected the fact that you said that with me and we went on that go around on Facebook. Listen to me. Right. Did you always want okay. to be a writer? Was that what you set out to do? Well, okay. I, I, I sort of unconsciously mimicked what my mother did because I was so much like her emotionally and in other ways. And, and that's not necessarily a good thing, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> to be very much like your mother. I, I was really extremely relieved when I heard I was having a boy. I mean, I really, I did, you know, <laughs> so that's complicated. But I think there was so much about her that I related to that that was kind of a destined thing. But for a while, I thought I would be, I mean, I was a sociology major at Berkeley. I was going to go to graduate school at Columbia, which is something I, I have intermittently regretted not doing. And I, I kind of wanted to be a social worker for 10 minutes. You know, there was a period when you wanted to do all these good things for people. <laughs> <laughs> and, a minute. <laughs> For 10 minutes, right? <laughs> but then I just kind of rolled into it, you know? Yeah, right. There you are. Yeah, but, but I think it was the, the first thing I wanted to do when I went from Berkeley to New York was to be a waitress at a groovy hip club. <laughs> that, that, that was beyond any other ambition that I had, and I was able to do that. Um, so listen to me. So you go yeah. to New York. You leave all of that stuff in L.A. You go to right. New York. How did, how did you make it? What was the story of your success? I mean, you, you may not say you are, but I will. You're one of the most revered writers that there are. It's- That's so nice of you. Well, I mean, it really took a long time. I mean, I just kind of put my head down, and for a long time I wasn't that at all. I mean, I was just a, a you know, then typewriter, founding a f- freelancer. I didn't have a, one single connection. It was Very few people came from California to New York at the time, and I wasn't a person who made connections very well, which is actually one of the reasons that in these interviews, like the one in the Times, I say that I admire the three women I, I just wrote about because they were able to do office politics and they were able to make friends with the right people, something I've never been able to do. <laughs> so, the turning point for me was in the um, in the late 80s when just in terms of what was going on in the world in America, 
America, issues with women were coming to the fore in an interesting way. There were women that were they were accusing their husbands of molesting their kids, rightly or wrongly. The law had not caught up with feminism, and re- sort of really horrible things were happening to women. There was just a very intense feeling of the the gap between what should be and what the law was allowing us to. I mean, a, a movie like Thelma and Louise epitomized this this very emotional feeling that women had that horrible things were happening and the law wasn't protecting women. And at that time, I had a friend in Momville. I was the mom of a little boy and a friend of mine had a best friend who was always telling my friend, our mutual friend, that her husband was going to kill her. And I thought, ah, the woman's being completely overdramatic. And then he actually did kill her and he hid the body. The body was discovered. He had a horrible, horrible history of everything in the book from trying to kill a previous wife to being dangerously HIV positive to um, to being a drug addict to being a, a, a cross-dresser. All these things we're not supposed to say are bad now, but they're not trem- tremendously terrific when you've killed your wife and you have two young children. And he got custody of the kids. So I kind of jumped into the story with my friend and another woman, and we became zealots for getting the kids away from this dangerous man and kind of trying to turn around a a very bad law. So that is what changed me from somebody who wrote kind of soft pieces for women's magazines. Not that there's anything wrong with women's magazines. I love them and make my bread and butter from them. But at the time, I didn't even think of myself as a journalist. I just thought of myself as someone who'd published one novel and then just sort of did other things. But, you know, I, I didn't do real journalistic things. When this happened, I plunged into this world of really doing uh, investigative journalism, talking to cops and lawyers, learning stuff I never knew before, and writing about women's justice issues. And that sort of became my beat. So, and um, the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, that, right? that really turned I, the cor- cor- yeah that really turned the corner for me. And I remember sitting with two young DAs in a funky little bar near City Hall. And I had a really bad cold. We were just ordering burgers, and I had been interviewing movie stars like like Joan Collins for you know the old time Hollywood uh, star yeah magazines like yeah, yeah like McCall's where it was easy to do movie stars, not like now. And I was sitting there and thinking, this is so much cooler <laughs> talking to DAs about how how you get kids away from a, a dangerous father and how bad the law is, and I just want to do this now. Then I kind of jumped into it. And see, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I do believe only you could have written this particular book, The Newest Sorority, The Ongoing and Perfect Mm. Complicated Triumph of Women in TV News, because I think in order to write about these three women, uh, Katie Couric, Diane um, Sawyer, and Christiane Amanpour, you had to have some understanding about what that climb would be. Not anybody mm-hmm. could write that as far as I'm concerned. And that was one of the things that I found so compelling because I knew the wisdom of your own career, knowing you a little bit, was behind what you were not only perceiving, but recording and interpreting for us. There, There is a game to success. You just mentioned one. You said, yeah. you know, you got to have political savvy in, 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 in the in the doggy dog world to play yeah, and, that game. And tremendous confidence. I mean, I think I think one of the things about this book because these were women who woke up every morning not hearing the word no. It sounds sloganistic, but they just wouldn't be stopped. I mean, they had people that tried to stop them that said they were perky in Katie's case or that they were too foreign and they weren't blonde and and pretty enough in Christian's. And they didn't they didn't care. They just pushed forward and they just loved working, which is, I think, a good message for women now. Absolutely. Let me ask you yeah. this question before we go further with this. Do you think that the, the climb up the ladder to success is different from men or women or is that a cliche? Um, well, you know, I didn't want to. It, it's funny. I <laughs> had this two-edged, double-edged sword with this book. I mean, I didn't want to be what my husband calls brave, bold woman-y about it. You know, <laughs> like, a lot, you know. But, the screaming so, feminist. So I, yeah, yeah. Right, but, right. Um, and so now, of course, I'm, I'm criticized for being nasty to these women <laughs> or letting sources say things that, in fact, in most offices, people, when they have a couple of drinks under their belts or even if they don't, will talk about their bosses or their colleagues the way my sources talked about these women because offices are ecosystems where, you know, some people succeed, some people fail, some people try to get other people fired, some people hog the spotlight, some people are perfectionistic and make it hard for others. So I, I thought it was very interesting getting the, the back room, you know, the back office net, network stuff in there. But it was, it's been criticized for being very hard on these women. And wrong. Um, and wrong. Let me just say this. Let me, I'm yeah. coming to your defense on this because I Thank feel you. so, no, no, no. I don't have to because I know you can hold your own, but I want to yeah. say my piece about that if you don't mind. And yeah. that is this. There is no way the true story of what these women did and what they endured yeah. and what they put themselves through to get where they got to could be told without telling the back room story. You could, could not. Yeah. I've been in that world, you know, like you. We both know yeah. what goes on behind the scenes. I don't think the 
the world really does. I think they're cliched knowledge, but I think yeah. what you did was truly, it's like the onion. You peeled away the layers and the layers and the layers and you got down to the bottom line. Was it pretty? No. Was it bitchy? Yes. So, yeah. hello, welcome to the world, right? Yeah, and, and men were bitchy too. You know? Right, and, that's and, my and point. Lot, the, the stuff that went viral, they didn't pick up all the, the sort of the nasty things that Dan Rather and <laughs> Koppel. They and never Peter do, Jensen. darling. <laughs> they never, ever do. It's us, and we're going to yeah. talk about that in a second, about women yeah. and the role that they take. But So I want to ask you one other question before we really get into the meat of it, and that is, yeah. did you want to tell what, what you wanted to tell, or was it what you wanted to understand? Was that how you addressed it? That, that's a great question. I started, when I wrote the proposal, I thought I, I was going to talk about, the book was going to be about how the idea of what is news changed because, you know, women became a part of the conversation that in the earlier mid 60s, news was only about war and legislation and, you know, and even convention coverage was all these guys in suits, all that stuff. And that everything from feminism to civil rights movement, to the human potential movement, to the escalation of celebrity stories, to a sense of relatability, to the um, those all those um, political sex scandals and uh, dramatic crime stories stories that we had in the 90s, all of that changed the idea of what news was, That and that women had something to do with that. That was my kind of thesis in the proposal. But when I started interviewing, I realized that was part of it. But the main story was how these women knew what they wanted to do and wouldn't be deterred, and how they strategized and how they worked toward it and, you know, worked around the blockades and, you know, made the alliances and, and, and worked harder than people really knew. Um, I don't think most people think that Diane Sawyer is someone who gets up in the middle of the night and emails people and calls the newsroom all the time and, you know, sleeps on baggage carts in, in airports and, and goes around putting on her own makeup in the back of a cargo plane, but she does. So it became a story of women succeeding, yes, in a very male field and women loving work and having a tremendous amount of confidence in themselves. And I love that. I, this, is, this is interesting to me, the, the subtitle, The Ongoing, Imperfect, mm-hmm. Complicated <laughs> Triumph of women in TV news. Did you think that that was true before you wrote the book or is that a conclusion after all the research and your considerable yes. efforts? Yeah, at, at the beginning, the, the subtitle was without the, without the parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I think I actually called it a sorority of sisters. I, 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 it was a more complicated title and people have said, why do you use the word sorority? That sounds kind of diminishing. Yeah, I was going to ask know. you that as a matter of fact. Yeah. Tell me why. Tell me it, why. It, it's interesting. Christiane Amanpour gave a speech to a news group and she t- it was talking about war reporters, conflict zone reporters, and she said, our sorority. Now, I could never find that later, but I had it. I knew I had it. And what struck me is she used a counterintuitive gender for something that, you know, I mean, obviously war reporters were overwhelmingly male, aside from her and some other really incredible women who I mentioned in the book. And I loved what she did with that. She intentionally used a gender that you don't think of for that. So I, I that was where the sorority thing popped out for me, her use of it, as if to say, um, don't just assume it's, it's guys that are doing this. And so then it just became, in, in talking to my agent and this and that, it became the news sorority. And I, I, I like it. I think it's a good... No, I actually think you know, it works because yeah. sorority has a double-edged sword. I mean, there's a wonderful part about women and being together in sisterhood, but there's yeah. also the bitch part. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, you know I what? That, yes. <laughs> I mean, and that's yeah. not a bad thing because, I mean, that's what it, that's part of, you know, the, what, chutzpah. I mean, you could use a whole lot of words besides yeah. bitch, but, but there's but that's a, a interesting. Sti- you see it as that because I, I thought that some people saw it as, oh, um, Reese Witherspoon's movies, you know. Oh, you mean girly? Legally no. blonde, that Oh, kind no, of I didn't go there at all. I didn't go there yeah. at all. But that's yeah. me. I mean, that, that, uh, you know, I love titles that make you think. So there you go. Yeah. But I, I want to just do this too. I want to ask you another question. Do you think the climbs to the top were any more difficult for these women than, than, you know, people in a small town who have a big company and they wind, they wind up these mm-hmm. you know getting to the top of it do in other words are we are we doing something by saying well you know they're celebrities so therefore you know that makes a whole big difference theirs was a harder mm-hmm. climb is it than any than the girl next door who makes it in her own 300 people routine you know you never thought this woman was going to get to the top but she does right I, I think there are rules from this that I'm going to pull out with the marketing people I'm going to we're going to find a way to get them to women's clubs and so forth because I think there are definitely kind of rules you can pull out of all three of their experiences that can help those women. But I think women are doing better all over the place. They're certainly getting better educated than men. More women are getting PhDs now. 
I think what happens, and I did, I did an op-ed for time.com the other day about it. There's something that people who are academic in the business field call the leaky pipeline. Women have more bachelor's, master's, and PhDs than, than men do in America. But when you get to the leaders of the top of the Fortune 500 companies, it's minuscule. Right. Minuscule and it hasn't grown. So somewhere between getting really well prepared and going out and fighting the battles and doing the things that Sheryl Sandberg did and stands for, something is not happening. And, and that's an interesting thing to explore. And there are definitely some academics that are looking at it. Uh, I think one thing is, and the reason I wrote that essay was that when women are aggressive and compete with each other, it, it automatically is called a cat fight. Hmm. And when men do it, it's, it's perfectly okay. But I, I think in general, I mean, it just seems to me that there are women that are heading businesses much more than they ever did before. I think we're like three generations into the assumption that a, a woman will keep working, that she's not going to just go home and that raising kids is part of what she does, but it's not all of what she she does. Economics have a lot to do with it, too. And uh, uh, I guess the aspect that I wanted to travel down here a little bit with is the fact that these three women are celebrities. They're journalists, see, yeah. but they're also celebrities. And, right. and and that's our fascination with them. And they mm-hmm. did it on a large scale, so to speak, in a big picture atmosphere where we're all right. aware of it. But on the other hand, there were women who were doing exactly what they're doing, a lot more women, which you, you just uh, made the point of, mm-hmm. who were doing it on a, uh, on a lesser level that they don't get the notoriety because they're not quote-unquote celebrities. They're just guys darn Mm hard-working women. And and that's a point I think that needs to be made because it'll come up in a minute when we get into the conversation about, you know, the career rise of Barbara uh, Walters um, Mm -hmm. as their role model. So let me put that on hold for a second. Let me get back to this, which is, right, you opened this book, (laughs) The New Sorority, with 20-second teasers, an arc of a story in eight sound bites with some pretty powerful and illuminating quotes, I got to say. How'd yeah, you they're pick back the, and forth, right? I love, <laughs> they're but, good and bad. <laughs> I, but I love those quotes because I think you put it right there. That's it. You yeah. read those and you understand the game that we women have to fight for if yeah. we're going to get anywhere in life, if that's our goal. So in that, you know, in, in the business world. So which one do you think is the most germane to the lesson of their these women's stories? Can can you do that off the, the top? Uh, uh, of those eight things? Yeah. Maybe, that, maybe at this point, at this point right now, and it wouldn't have been true a year ago, what the note that Leslie Stahl gave to Susan Zariski when they were both young girls during Watergate. They're fuckers, but we'll, but we'll have fun anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and Susan Zerinsky still has it in her wallet, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> which is, you know, like, and, and, and the reason it's apt now is Diane no longer is anchor. Christiane is not seen that much anymore. Right. And Katie, you know, is, is not seen that much anymore. So right. people have made the point that these women, when I was writing the book, they were out there visible on your tube every single day and, and they no longer are. So if I had to pick one of them, I guess it would be that one. Yeah, I, mean, I you think know what? All, I knew that know, was the one you were going to pick. Okay, right. How, how am I getting to know you, girlfriend? I mean, I knew. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I want to say something. When you mentioned celebrity, I, I want to answer a point. Go People have for- said to me, why didn't you do like Martha Raddatz or Gwen Eiffel or Judy Woodruff? And honestly, there's a glamour potential in the women that I chose. When you are on TV, there is a glamour potential. I mean, there, there, that is a factor. You have to have that charisma. You have to have that mystery that you're relatable to the audience, but you're also intriguing. And there's a, it's attractiveness, it's charisma, it's attitude, it's performance ability. It's all of those things. And, and indeed they are, they are celebrities. They do serious work, but they have that patina of celebrity. Well, I think that's the whole package. I think, I, believe me, I thought about that too. And I thought about, you know, yeah. bringing that up. But I, at the end of the day, where I got to was, yeah, those women Women are, are wonderful news reporters. There's no question about it. Yeah, they don't have yeah. the whole package. It's a different. Right. It's a different. It's a different. Thing. It's a different, they, it's a different yeah. thing. Absolutely, no question yeah. about it. And I don't think that's something to apologize for. I think that that's also where we are today yeah. in in society. And I think that's uh, not something that we should not not point out. We right. should point that out. All right. And the other thing is, you did not interview them. And I know why. I know that you went to get an interview with Katie and with who was the other one. And, and then at the end, you just said you couldn't get the first two. I'm not going for the third. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you I, something. I, didn't want to, I also didn't want to push my life with Christiane. She gave me a lot of people. Right. And those people led to other people. And the energy of the of the research picked up when, when she came into, into the game. I was suddenly talking to people that were in funky hotels, dodging sniper fire as opposed to just producers who were changing networks and talking about going from ABC to NBC. And it was just, my heart was racing more. It was just such a different kind of interview that I, I didn't want to then gild the lily and, and try to get something from her. But but there's another thing too, which is I can be aggressive as a reporter, I guess, because people tell me, but I'm, I'm really very kind of Sally Field-like in my personal psychology. And I just didn't want to 
Go there. Push hard for okay. an interview. That would, A, have a lot of strings attached by the publicist, and I'd feel a little abashed talking to them. I might come away a little more enamored of them that, than I thought would be healthy. And it was easier to talk to people that knew them. than Can I make this point, to too? Because to you've written many biographies. But don't you think not interviewing them, in a sense, gave you a better picture? I do. I, I, it sounds a little self-serving to say it, so, I, you know, I kind of didn't volunteer it. And since you did, I... I, I think so. It, I've done a lot of books like that. I, I started out doing crime books, and so one person was dead and one person was in jail. So I couldn't talk to the two people. And I started doing what my original editor on the first of those books called Chorus of Voices Reporting, which is everybody around them, from the cops to the DAs to the childhood best friend to the ex-husband to the colleagues, and I found that that was a good way to tell a story. So I used that same technique on the last book and on this one. Yeah, I, I think it works. All right, let's 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 have some fun. Let's get to Diane okay. Sawyer. I think that most people know that she's Kentucky born and bred. She's smart. Yes. She's gorgeous. She's formidable. She worked for President Nixon, then right. returned to newscasting. I'm going to give a little background. Eventually becoming the first uh, featured female journalist on the CBS a magazine, 60 Minutes, and a pioneer yeah. at the anchor desk at ABC. But the dynamics of her childhood, oh my God. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh my God. I mean, what a mother. Talk to me. Oh, what a mother, yes. Yikes. The tiger mom of, Whoa. of Louisville. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, people who I interviewed who know her now said the secret to Diane, the secret to that perfectionism, that workaholism is her mother. <laughs> the, her mother rules. And, you know, I have some anecdotes in the book where the minute her mother would walk in the room, her whole demeanor would change. And, you know, her mother, she got to Ken Starr, big scoop interview after Watergate. And her mother said, her mother, who's, you know, conservative Christian, said, you made fun of his religion. And that completely, her face fell. Both of her parents were up from poverty. They were, grew up in Appalachian, on Appalachian farms during the Depression. And they became very respectable. And her father died when she was 23 in a mysterious car accident that some people think was a suicide. It's never been decided one way or another and people are very delicate about that. It was a, just an odd plummet off, off an overpass but her mother is just a tenacious, credible, strong, steely mother. Diane had every single kind of lesson you could get and yeah, that was, it was yeah. she's a, probably the biggest force in her life. Yeah, it's, it, it's curious because I heard through some grapevine and I don't know if it's true or not that the reason that she just retired when she did was because her mother's not well and she needs to go take care of her mother. It's almost as if her whole life was lived in the sense to satisfy her mother. Uh, you get that feeling? It's funny what you said, the, the last thing. I, I have it in the book. When the, the noise was getting kind of loud that David Muir was getting a lot of ratings on, on his substitute nights, I think she put it out there that, well, her huh. mother is sick, you know, and, and that was something she put out there to have a good reason in case he replaced her permanently. Then when she did go off the air, and I wrote a little essay about it and mentioned her mother being sick, <laughs> an ABC publicist, who I'd gotten along with very well, called me and tried to guilt me and said, how dare you, or how, what, what, I don't think it was nice of you to to use the fact, you know, an assertion that Diane's mother was ill to talk about her going off the air. And I said, God, I, you know, I think she kind of put that out, of her, her. out there herself a year, a year ago. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And it saved her in a way. So why why not play that? Listen to me yeah. also. I, one overarching strength. I'm going to ask you certain questions of each of these women. But in, in Diane's yeah. case, what do you think that one thing that brought her along on her climb to the top? What do you think that was? If you had to narrow it down to one. Her strong Methodist upbringing. That strong, you know, having two parents who'd worked themselves up from poverty, who really had principles and ideals, who were very, in a good way, old fashioned about making a good life for yourself, doing well. Oh, you know, that, that theme she has of purpose, having a life of purpose, even that beauty contest that people make fun of. Uh, it was led by a woman who was extremely religious. Her husband, son, and father were all ministers. She was very connected with the Norman Vincent Peale movement. And Diane was absolutely so influenced by her, this Catherine Marshall. Catherine Marshall. I think it, I think it is it, it, that, that kind of moral impulse to do good and to, she said to her friend, turn your pain into purpose, to just work all the time, to do well, to, to dot every I and cross every T and, and those kind of old-fashioned values that, that are very strong in her. Yeah, amazing. She's, she comes across as being very nearly perfect. A little scary. So if, if something in herself was staying in her way, what would that be now that you've researched her so exhaustively? Hmm. Well, she was very nearly perfect, but what I loved about it was she had no furniture in her apartment. <laughs> when she met Mike Nichols, she didn't know how to cook. <laughs> 
that. So there were a lot of things. She didn't really want to have kids. I mean, there, you know, she was this southern genteel w- woman, you know, but sort of, but not really. But but she had these this bohemian side, this very totally work focused side that was very undomestic, which was very kind of attractive. I I don't think there was much that stood in her way. I mean, not many people could have gone through spending eight years with the most disgraced president in recent history and quickly vaunted past the CBS News people's utter cynicism of her and become a favorite there. I mean, very few other people would would be able to do that. So there's just, you know, just she had the least to overcome. The other two had other things to overcome. But she had the least to overcome, I think. Okay, well, you brought him up, and so let's talk very quickly about Mike Nichols. She finds him late in life, and this is like what? This is like the love affair of like uh, the love affair of yeah. Yikes! This is a. I think we can safely say he's one of the most sophisticated men in America. Uh-huh. And but when you read what they say about each other, it's like, <laughs> you know, right? It's it's like a harlequin romance, <laughs> and I've, I've talked to people that aren't that that are skeptical about Diane because even though you say she's perfect. She's very indirect. She's very seductive. She's very, she's an incredible chess player. People have used that word admiringly, admiringly and not. And even people that are skeptical about her in certain ways, when you ask them, okay, what's her relationship with Mike like? They get all verbally and googly. I've never seen two people who are so in love. I love it. So this is definitely a, a, a real love affair. Okay. So Sheila, what don't you like about her? <laughs> 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 well, mean question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I think it's it's funny. I, I I thought that when I was writing this, I thought she was the one that came across as the one with the most edges. I mean, people would get fired. People would suddenly have to go and take care of uh, sick relatives, and that wasn't really the reason they were leaving her show. The whole thing about she does things with no fingerprints is a, a real meme that people use about her. So that's an edgy part of of her. I mean, it it is it is made for her success. It has enabled her to get only the best in terms of teams and if, if her show isn't working she'll you know try somebody else so um, I both admire it but also think I, there are people that think it's very slippery and I, I get it yeah yeah well, she made a choice, didn't she? She was going to go all the way, and she didn't care how she yeah. did it. And I think that's what you do do when you get in that field. I, I or think it is. It yeah. is. And who are we to judge? <laughs> yeah. Or maybe not. I don't know. Uh, we were going to go through a break, but I just told my staff, we're going straight through. This is too good to stop. Okay. <laughs> you are delightful, darling. It's so nice to have you here. Same here. I mean, yeah. unbelievable. So listen, Sheila, let's take a look at Katie Couric. Sweet, perky okay. Katie Couric, who often referred yes. to as the girl next door. Yes, yes, uh-huh. yes. She began at CNN, anchored NBC's Today. Later on the CBS Evening News, she became the high-profile dinnertime anchor ever, yeah. right? Um, Which one, yep. Right? Uh, a publicist creation? She doesn't exactly come across as the girl next door. Talk to me. No, she really is the girl next door. I mean, she really, she says, I had to leave it to be her childhood. She had to leave it to be her childhood. <laughs> all right, fine. Great. Didn't we all? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> the mom, you know, a, a stay-at-home mom, a husband, a father that came home but with a briefcase at six, you know, three older siblings. It was the beginning of the 60s, and yet none of the kids rebelled. Uh, happy little community. They played, even, you know, she loved Karen Carpenter, every, the songs that, everything that I got from her childhood friends was, you know, leave it to Beaver. And yeah. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I tried to find something in there that wasn't. Uh, so so she was. Part of her personality that I tried to explain is it took on a different coloration with each stage of her life, but she has that snarky p- part of her personality, right. that slightly wounded, I'm going to make a joke, and maybe it's at your expense or maybe it's at mine, that slightly edgy thing, which of course made her so appealing on today and such a good interviewer. And at different stages of her life, it was manifested through different things. First, it was the youngest sibling wanting to get attention. Then when she didn't get into Smith and her two older siblings did, it was this, I'm, you know, I'm hurt that I didn't get into this top school and I'm going to prove it otherwise. And she kind of kept that as a grievance for a long time. Then she goes to CNN. Everybody thinks she's this little kid, this cute little lightweight, and she's completely obsessed with proving that she's not. So that it becomes, I'm going to show you in a different way. And always, and this is the thing that I really liked about her, and I hope it came through that I did. Because, I mean, I was a high school cheer, cheerleader, too. Me, too. Me, too. <laughs> so I get the thing of when you were... <laughs> 
something like a high school cheerleader, that, and if you want to say you were a high school cheerleader, <laughs> that immediately puts you down seven notches right. in certain snobby people, you know, estimation. And she liked that. But she now, that. but now, can we say now? Because in our day, it was yeah. kind of cool to be a cheerleader. But we were, we were, we were the brats, but you know, they thought we were what? We were snobs. We were, we were in a sorority of our own. But hasn't that you changed? Know, I, I, th- I think it affects. I mean, if cheerleader or the the girl next to her. The sense that she got, the vibe that she gave off at CNN, were one of two things. One was people thought she was great. She was ambitious. She had a personality that was really going to take her to the top. She made friends with everybody. She had from that wholesome childhood. She developed, again, these people skills that were so helpful in office politics, and they were helpful eventually in her today personality. So that half the people thought that. The other half thought she was just trying to be a celebrity. She was not interested in serious news. She was too cute, you know, that kind of thing. And she had to work against that, and she w- resented that. So that snarkiness, for lack of a better term, that kind of edginess was then powered by that sense of, I'm going to prove that I'm not what you think I am. And then, you know, the final piece of how that manifested itself to her was her husband dies, you know, in the prime of his life, in the prime of their marriage. And, you know, this thing that this is supposed to happen to you when you're that age and when your husband's that age happens. And it gave her a sense of just an in- internal irony that I, I think think kind of nourished her in a way and, and kind of fortified that sense of you don't know how substantial I am. You can go ahead and say I'm this, that, and the other thing. That's not going to hurt me because I know what I went through. I know what I suffered. Then also her sister died of cancer. Mm. And I know what I do. And what she did and does is a huge amount for cancer awareness and research. $320 million worth of funds that were very much sparked by her, the colon cancer campaign. The people in America know about colonoscopies because of her. And I think it's almost a secret self that she has. So when people criticize her, and I discovered by a certain daily news headline that three months ago that people like to put her down. When people put her down, she sort of has that sense of herself that is inviolate. You can't touch me there. You can say what you want about me. You can say that I didn't deserve to be in Walter Cronkite's chair. You can say that I got too much money. You can say that I shouldn't go to karaoke bars. And here I am. My life has been splashed in, in the National Enquirer. You can say that all you want, but I know who I am. And, and I think, yeah. I, yeah, I know. I understand where you're going with that. And I think that's probably true. I think that's part of the steeliness that's, that, that yeah. it, it, you know, is essential to who she is. It also speaks in a way to, you know, she understands her own vulnerabilities out in the, yeah. uh, in the orbit of it all. But there was one story, there were two stories, but one in particular that really got me in the book. And that was the one about her memorizing her sister's friends and her class. Yes, yes. If that doesn't tell you who this girl is from the beginning, I don't know what does. She went. I guess it does. You know, it's funny. The things that some. Well, but let's say what it is. About, but wait, let yeah, me just say from, she said it herself. Right. She's just proud of that. She memorized her her sister's friends in her sister's high school yearbook, and then went and made friends with all her sister's friends, telling yes. them right. I yeah. mean, that's that's nuts to me. But go ahead. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I thought it. I, I thought it was good. I, I think that's what politicians do. <laughs> no, I get that. That's I understand. You know what I do. Yeah, right. I'm put. Let's put my. I say nuts. Let me put that in quotes. I mean, that tells yeah. you pretty clearly where she was going and what she wanted and how she was going to play it. The other one that I wanted to talk about was the fact that she was bulimic. And I think that is also very telling because bulimia is about feeling out of control and trying to gain control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, And isn't that a lot of her life? That's interesting. I mean, she's famously messy. You know, and brags right. about being messy. All her friends, uh, when people said, I, I said, talked about her messiness, like tisk, tisk, tisk. That was her friend in Red Book Magazine talking about how funny, how funny it was, how messy Kitty was. So there's a part of her that kind of is not in control. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, it's kind of known now that the um, eating disorders are, well, I, I always thought they were considered the good girl's disease where you, that's yeah. how they call them. Yeah. She, she says that came from not getting into Smith. That came from thinking she was less than her sisters and therefore she was going to, you know, control things that way. And I think it's very yeah. insightful into who she deals yeah. with on the inside out, which is why I wanted to bring it. Uh, and in, in this, in, for the sake of time, the biggest surprise for you about her? She mentioned it herself. When she did the daytime show, she pulled out a lot of stuff about herself. Because when you do the daytime show, you really want to relate to, you know, your audience. And she had, I think, Demi Lovato on and she talked about her bulimia. And, it's, and it was all over the place. She announced her bulimia. 
I, I was surprised. I, I kind of was surprised. I'm not sure why I was surprised. Also, that was having an eating disorder before it was they were known. You know, it was when Karen Carpenter died, which was in mm, the early 70, 80s. Wasn't it late? Se- yeah, late 70s, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's when eating. That's when people knew about anorexia nervosa. Right. Before that, it was it was very hidden. But that so, was the big. Uh, but as far as Katie Couric and and all of your research on her, what was the biggest yeah. surprise that you discovered about her that you know went wow I didn't know that or I didn't think that or was there something about her that you learned that uh, you like her I can tell. <laughs> I'm glad you say that because there are people that think I don't. No, I think you do. I think you do. I More do. than I do. I, I lo- yeah. Yeah. You know, she she had trouble at some of her networks. She she put her foot in it a couple of times. People were gunning for her at CBS. They thought she just came in with too much money, you know, when she yeah, had well, too she much did. celebrity status. <laughs> um, no, I think she's, you know, and, and, and she flaunts her girlfriend girlness. She fla- and, and of the three of them, she is the most hardcore feminist. She really is. She's the one that told Liz Smith, stop talking about our hair. You know, when, and when she compared herself to Hillary Clinton, I thought it was legitimate. The Daily News thought, oh, my God, she's comparing herself to Hillary Clinton. Oh, well, I, yeah, because they didn't understand what the point that she was trying yeah, to make. Yeah, I, no, think I, mean, she, I think she, I think she made a fair point. Yeah, and she yeah. compared herself legitimately. Yeah, yeah, I think so. No, I do like Katie. What surprised me? I'm trying to think what surprised me. I can't, I, I could think of something later. No, nothing, nothing struck me as that surprising about her. And I think of the three of them, she's the one that people knew the most. And the one that people knew the least was Christiane. Right. And let's get to Christiane then. All right. Christiane Amanpour. I think she's, as you said, the least none of the three. But she yeah. was born in a British Catholic mother, an Iranian Muslim father, shattered stereotypes right. about physical appearance, that's for sure, speech patterns yeah. and career paths by joining yeah. cable television network CNN and gaining fame as an international war correspondent before attempting studio work. <sighs> Fascinating woman. This woman, fa- well, I'll tell you, you know, the thing that struck me so funny about her was her her obsession with Liza Minnelli and uh, of Elizabeth course. I Taylor. know, I love that. Right? I mean, I who would have thought? Friend, Except- Diana Bellew, and, yeah. and Diana, I hope, is, 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 is not thinking, oh my God, why did I tell her those things? Her, both of her sisters said, you have to talk to Diana Bellew. And so I called South Africa. It was the most worthwhile conversation. And the, oh, the sisters told me that the Liza Minnelli scrapbook, the fair faucet hair, and the fact that in her convent school, the second convent school, she told me that she was a princess. <laughs> I love that, too. I love that. Yes, don't you? Oh, my God, what a clever girl. You know, and, and it's not, I mean, look, when we're 11 years old, we do all kinds of funny things, and 12 years old. And I think, ultimately, it was, first of all, her best friend was, was really a princess in Iran. You know, she was such a princess that the Pahlavi families were, you know, nouveau riche next to Next to this this girl's family, but I think it was it was a sense of a of a young woman of a girl who knew there was something special about her her that there was something that was going to be very distinctive. And when you're 12 years old, what does that translate into? Well, I'm different than these other English girls, these blonde girls, freckle faced girls from from England. I'm this um, Iranian girl, so I'm going to say that I'm a princess, <laughs> and they believed it. I love that story. I think that's just great. And that gives you an insight as to who the creative mind that she really has. Because I think she, yeah. of all the three, there's a very one-dimensional picture of her because she hasn't yeah. spoken a lot about who she is and what she's about, and the press hasn't gone there with her. So it was delightful to read what you had to say about her. I mean, including, you know, I think it is important to bring up the fact that she not only went through the Iranian Revolution, how her whole life yeah. changed exponentially after that. I mean, that's a huge, mm-hmm. huge thing to come up. But I love the stories also about the fact that she moved in with John F. Kennedy Jr. and wound up being his lover for a time. I mean, that... Well, the, actually, she wasn't his... Actually, that's going to be corrected in the next edition. She, she, she says no? She was friend. Okay. She was always his friend. That, that's complicated, Hallie. <laughs> yes, that is very complicated. She, uh, but they uh, had a very unique relationship. Uh, there is I'll, no... I'll say, I will say this. Like saying that she was a princess uh, and like being at CNN and letting people think she went to Brown when she really went to URI, right. I think there were certain assumptions that she kind of let people make that maybe weren't, um, you know, she, but she was cl- really close friends with him throughout their lives until he died. Right. And I think he looked at her. This is somebody the most, he's like, was like the Prince of America. And in fact, I know I'm friends with somebody who was his longest term girlfriend. So I know a bit about him through her. He, he was really like the Prince of America and he could choose anybody he wanted to be friends with. And he looked at her and there was something so self-possessed about her, so confident. So he, she had an attitude that was so just appealing to somebody who was John Kennedy's son and Jackie Kennedy's son that he wanted to impress her. He wanted to be best friends with her. And that says a lot about a, a certain magnetism that she had. 
Right. Early on, by the way. Yeah. Early on. And yet she was kind of late in coming into her career and figuring out what it is that she wanted to do. She uh, was. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's that's also fascinating. I want to talk about that career of hers. Yeah. And I think one story tells it all. And that's where was she? Was she in Iran when it happened or where was she when when they, she, she got held by gunpoint and the other two walked away? Left? Oh, oh, oh that, that was that was uh, one of many things. That was yikes. that was Afghanistan. Yeah, that's what, that was in 97, the beginning of the Taliban, when America didn't really know who the Taliban were. And she and her team were investigating a, a supposedly a red. The Red Cross said uh, the Taliban um, is claiming something is a woman's hospital, but we really don't think it is. And so they went in there and they were detained by the Taliban, and then they were driven in a truck to an empty yard, one of those yards that we, we would see in photographs right after 9/11. You'd see people beheading you know, the Taliban, driving people in those big trucks. And they were held there. They were tied up. And there was a, a member of the Taliban that figured two things out about her. A, she was seemed like a Western woman because she was a reporter, which you're not supposed to be as a woman by the Taliban. Also, that he knew she was Iranian. And he just knew it by the way she looked, not even her name. And the Taliban, the Arab Taliban, not the, the native Taliban were kind of four higher guys. They didn't have so much politics. But the Arab Afghans were zealots and they hated the Iranians and they hated Western women. So this guy circled her for about an hour, kept making the knife under the throat um, uh, gesture gesture, and said he was going to kill her. And two buddies who were with her and couldn't do anything to help her said, I've never seen her scared before, This is, but I really saw her scared. Then finally they got they got rescued and, and then... <laughs> Like at 45 minutes later, they're they're in a studio and they realize that the Taliban were so stupid they forgot to turn off the, the <laughs> reporters' cameras. <laughs> so they got all the footage and they're jumping up and down, so excited that they got the footage and Christiane's jumping up and down with them. So that the fact that for two hours she thought she could be murdered suddenly dissolves. I mean, it's an <laughs> amazing this comradely thrill that they got the footage. <laughs> I love that story. I yeah, understand that. It's a great story. And it really tells you who she is. I mean, she is cool yeah. under fire. There is no question about that. Here's something else I want to talk to you briefly about with her. Yeah. And that's the fact that she's later married, like later yeah. in life, to Jamie Rubin. He reminds right. me of her dad, handsome as the day is long. A handsome, bit of a bon handsome, vivant, yes. right? Like her dad. She married her father. Well, that's interesting. I, I, I never thought he was like her dad. See, and I do. I mean, I just, I, yeah. I just, hmm. I don't know why. I just, I just, I just yeah. see that. But there she is, this steely, smart, clever, mm-hmm. puts her life on the line all the time. And at the end of the day, she gets married to a nice, handsome boy, right? Yes, Jewish with, boy, with by the way. Engagement ring. Yes. <laughs> and does Some that whole thing? Take- <laughs> Some people said, take that out because everybody flashes their engagement ring. No! I I I guess I came from a different generation where, to me, flashing your engagement ring is like the bachelorette. But but to (laughs) my mind, you know what? Christian Amanfor would do that. Because what that spoke to uh, to me about when I read that was about the fact that really she's just a regular girl at the bottom of it all. I mean, she's, you know. Yeah, and she made a decision. She, She made a decision to change her life. She put career first. She had a lot of different boyfriends and her sister said, hey, you know, and people said she, she's honest about that. You know, a lot of different boyfriends and she was in war zones where relationships are very perishable. They're very intense and they're very perishable. And at a certain point, she made a decision that she was going to change her life, that she was going to have a personal life. And shortly after she met Jamie Wubin and they fell madly in love with each other. Another one of those Mike and Diane stories. Right. Crazy, huh? Um, which is an, another little point about this. My three rock and roll women hmm. had complicated parents. There was something a little off in each of their family histories. Carly's was incredibly exotic. With Carol, it was the parents married and remarried. There was a son who was very severely developmentally challenged. Joni had, had a complicated thing with her parents. These three women had very normal parents. Married, mom was a housekeeper, housemaker. I mean, very, very stable, stable, stable parents. I think that enabled them to have a certain confidence in themselves and also to be able to relate to the public as women wearing jackets, talking to mainstream America through a TV screen. They were able to um, process a certain conventional expectation. Um, the other thing about them is my rock and roll women had a lot of different boyfriends, and they wrote about the ups and downs, and that was what it was about. These women had monogamous relationships, fell in love in a very traditional way, and fell, fell madly in love with their husbands, and stayed married, and I, th- I think that was is also part of their success. When the news is your boss, when you're in Afghanistan and you suddenly have to fly to Haiti, when you're planning a party and you suddenly have to fly to Egypt, 
There's enough going on. You're competing with another network all the time. There's enough going on in your life. You want a stable relationship. They all got them. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting to me also, they're grounded. These women are well-grounded women. I yeah. think that's what they got from their childhood. There was yeah. like there was something at their back all the time that they could take with right. them through life, unlike the girls and, and girls like us. Christiane, biggest surprise? Christiane, biggest surprise? Mm-hmm. There's the lies of Manoli scrapbook stuff. <laughs> the, you know, the girl, the girl that she was, the fact that she ingratiated herself to the nuns and the headmistress. You know, this is somebody who the minute she got to CNN, she was talking in everybody's face. She was uh, considered very uh, imperious. And the, she, again, you don't get to where these women got without an incredible amount of emotional intelligence, knowing how to work it with people. And each of them did it in a different way. I, I admire that. I don't have that. <laughs> no, I <laughs> don't know? think I that's mean, totally I know true. people in my life who do have it, including my son. <laughs> right. Well, that's a good thing to uh, have. Know, There's no question about I, it. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's a great thing. And a surprise about Christiane, let me think, there was another thing. Uh, again, that, that it was serendipitous that she became a, a reporter right. because it's, she's so incredibly passionate and principled. But she rolled into it. She wanted to be a doctor. She didn't get good grades. When she graduated high school, she didn't even apply to college. She worked in a department store. Then her flighty younger sister ditched out on a journalism I love uh, that story. course right. to marry a rock and roll guy. So Christiane took the course instead, and she realized she wanted to do that. And then the, when the revolution came, that really was what affected her, that that steeled it. But if her sister had taken the journalism class and somehow the impact of the revolution was less uh, compelling, what would she be doing today? I mean, I have to believe that she would be what she was because you don't do what she has been doing for 20 years and not have that be a destined life for yourself. Let me let me take this out a little bit further with a few other questions because I think that they're mm-hmm. relevant to, to the power of this book that you've just uh, brilliantly written, and that is this. You're talking about a lot about some of the early women pioneers, including, of course, Barbara Walters. By the way, mm-hmm. that pink, everything in her office was pink, pink typewriter pink. Everything in her office I was pink. I think that is absolutely amazing information. I know. Uh, Talk about rubbing it in right? a bit. Yeah. Oh my God, I right. love it. Oh, and she paid a huge pri- emotional price. That's huge the, price. Right. Yeah. Her, her, you read her biography, and oh my God. But in, yeah. in the case of Walters, who really had a hard time breaking it in and, and, and paving yeah. the way, I, this is where I want to go with it. And that was a line that came from Walter Cronkite, who after Barbara's rise to the anchor chair, said something like to the effect of, and I'm going to paraphrase, about yeah. blurring the lines between news and entertainment had been pierced. Yes, yes. Was he totally wrong? Oh, oh God, that's it's a hard answer. I mean, he was as pissy as the other guys oh, were for when sure. he got yeah. uh, the anchor chair. Oh, my God, my role, you know. Right. And, and he is so hagiographied. I mean, he was really not what he was made out to be. Is that wrong? Probably, probably not wrong. I right. mean, th- there, I mean, I think what news is has changed. I mean, I'm forgetting who it was now, either Dick Salant or what, one of the one of the great fabulous heads of the network would not let Elvis's death be the leading story, would not let the other one would not let the Beatles coming to America be the leading story. Um, when you look at that, uh, uh, where we are today, that seems crazy. So I, I suppose that is one way of looking at it. The lines have kind of blurred. You also have a blurring of the lines of who is giving us the news. It, it's no longer, I mean, we now again have these three white men, and for a while it was two right. women and a guy, you know. But now it's not even, it's not even the 630 angles don't even mean that much. It's TMZ broke the Ray Rice story. TMZ did that. A crappy little celebrity, I mean, it's, you know, very well moneyed, but celebrity um, gossip site. Twitter followers did the Ferguson story. So who is giving us the news is, is different. Let, let me go uh, take it another place to be, I uh, have to do this because I think this is so uh, critical to, to this entire conversation. And that is, as you mentioned earlier, now the three of them are no longer at the head of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, their divisions. They're not on air like they used to. Katie's, you know, off to, to Yahoo and uh, Christiane's been kind of sidelined and Diane just stepped down. Okay, fine. Is that an aging out process? Is that something? we need to talk about? Uh, well, they were there for a long time. As Don Brown, in one of those 20-minute sound bites, 20-second sound bites, he said everybody thought women had a short shelf life, but they've, they've outlasted the guys. They've been there for a really long time. Is it an aging act? Well, Diane's at a, at a point where it, it's appropriate to retire. I mean, her. Well, I, when I say saying, aging out, I'm talking about women aging out versus men can go until the wrinkles are so deep that uh, you can... I see, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I think I think there's always the, that advantage. I mean, I, I think in media in general, young is better than old. I mean, I think it applies to both genders. It p- applies less to men than women. Uh, certainly in in movies, <laughs> you know, you, you've got a 50 year old guy romancing a you know a 30 year old woman, and, and, and actresses always complain about that. I think one of the reasons that David Muir was such an attractive candidate is that he's young. Scott Pelley's he's got that white hair, but he's younger than than his white hair would indicate. Brian Williams. Is it has kind of a youthful vibe to to him. I don't think we would have a Cronkite now. I don't think we would have. You know, we could I, use I a Cronkite I, now. I hate to tell you. What? I think we could use a Cronkite now. Not the not you, the creepy, you know, nasty whatever. But I think uh, yeah. a little straight news would be kind of a, a, a an interesting twist at this point. But that's a whole other conversation we that's can have. Yeah. I'm wondering if women in news have broken the glass ceiling, Sheila, or if they really uh, what they have done is redesign it to fit their needs. You know, I'm thinking about the fact that Katie wound up going to uh, you know daytime TV, whereas Meredith daytime TV. Mm-hmm. What what are your thoughts? Yeah, Meredith is a real trooper. She has a lot of challenges in her life. She's an amazingly admirable woman. She's done everything. You know, she's done every single form of TV, she, and she never stopped. I think, you know, again, it's it, the appointment TV is sort of over, or it's going to be over really soon. It is stuff that you get on your device. It is Twitter. It is TMZ coming out with something, these hidden, these you know, these pictures that kids in the street take that suddenly reveal all this stuff. So I think for for everybody in the business, it's it's, it's changing. But the the truth is, they've done the stats on it. The people that do watch the six thirty news want a, a man in in the anchor chair, a, a middle aged man or a younger middle aged man, white man in the anchor chair. I mean that that's why Katie lost her job when all is said and done. Uh, she couldn't beat out that truism. You know, Les Moonves at the beginning thought she's so effervescent, she has a brand. Uh, the, the 630 News needs to be shaken up, and she couldn't have agreed with it more. It didn't work that way. So, um, oddly enough, you know, we have a woman who's the front runner for President Hillary. We have women in so many amazing positions, but this is still one of those conventions that's very high bound. And women producers have said to me, and I have it in the book, that there are men with big tempers who keep getting rehired as producers. And the fact that they swear at people and they pound desks doesn't matter if they want to, if someone to come in to save a show, they'll get these guys. If a woman screwed up in one way or another, if she got a bad reputation for being aggressive, she doesn't get an, a next chance. So, um, you yeah. know, the, the, the women that I talk to feel that it's still a sexist world out there. You think these women measured up to their own expectations of themselves? I absolutely do. Unbelievable, you right? Know, I think each of them, you know, really accomplished a lot. And, and they, and they stood for causes. I mean, the Katie and the cancer is, is pe- people don't realize how, how much she's done. Christiane has told us about conflicts and, and peril to women and children, particularly in parts of the world that Americans didn't even know how to pronounce. Countries nobody knew existed. Gambia, this, you know, countries in Africa. I mean, she was very dedicated to telling those stories. And Diane has had a uh, one of the most important things to her that she's done for the past 10 years is her series on children in America, impoverished and at-risk children in America. And I think that is Diane, the Methodist girl in the, in the church choir who wants to, to do good. I think that's been coming out for a long time. And now that she doesn't do the 630 News anymore, you'll be seeing more of that better than we were. <laughs> okay, last question. You didn't get to interview the three of them, but if yeah. you had, one yeah. question, do you have a question that you wish that you could have asked each of them? Okay, well, I would have tried to bear down with Diane about Nixon, and other people did, and I think she would have given me the same answer that she gave to Kevin Sessom at Parade, which is, and she's given to others, I, if I was with him in the good times, I couldn't abandon him in the bad, and, and I don't think I could have gotten beyond that. Katie, that's a good question. Uh, I, I would ask her for her, and, I, and, and, and probably I should have tried to get more of her side of the CBS story. I mean, I did talk to an aide of hers who said kind of cryptically, they were, you know, it was not a team organization. They, they weren't happy for you. They were, it wasn't like NBC. But I would have, I would have asked her for her side of the, of the CBS story. And Christiane, um, God, that's a good question. I, 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 maybe I would have asked her, what was the experience that, that really scared you? Was there any experience that made you go home or go to your hotel room or go to your little bunker and, and say, I'm not going to do this anymore? I've been speaking with Sheila Weller, the author of The New Sorority, Diane Sawyer, Katie Couric, Christiane Amanpour, and the ongoing and perfect complicated triumph of women in TV news by way of Penguin Press, a book whose hype doesn't disappoint. Before 
Before I go, I want to remind everyone that podcasts of current and past shows are always available to listen to free on iTunes under The Halle Casser Jane Show. The Halle Casser Jane Show is also available for download via Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, BlogTalkRadio.com, and a host of other venues. Google The Halle Casser Jane Show and you will find us. Of course, podcasts over shows, both past and present, are always posted for your listening pleasure at HalleCasserJane.com, which I hope you'll visit often for the latest information on our upcoming segments. Oh, and while you're at HalleCasserJane.com, don't forget to visit my blog to read my latest musings. I'll be back next week, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for another edition of the Halle Casser Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Halle Casser Jane Show. Audible.com features over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Stay in touch, won't you? Remember, that's HalleyCasserJane.com. Discover us on Facebook at HalleyCasserJane and on Twitter at HalleyCJ. I love to hear from you. So, till we meet again, this is Hallie Casser Jane. It's a wrap. Mm-hmm.